the Severn Valley Railway, one of the longest and most well-known steam railways in Britain. But what happened to the first six valley railways, I hear you ask? Well, forget it. There's enough history to cover just with this one, for this is a line that has battled with two of the most unpredictable forces in the world, Mother Nature and the Council. Steaming 16 miles in Great Western countryside, between Worcestershire and Shropshire, the Severn Valley is a powerhouse for heritage traction. Let's take a look at its history, its engines, and the line today. It was built in 1862, to connect Hartlebury and Shrewsbury, linking with several collieries along the way, first run by the West Midlands Railway, and soon after the Great Western. It had a happy existence, until both passengers and goods traffic declined, due to those meddling roads, more on that later. After 101 years, closure of much of the line was announced in March 1963. Some locals stepped in to say, oh no you don't, and as tradition with all serious matters in Britain, a meeting was held in a pub to discuss what to do. They mentioned the success in saving the Bluebell Railway further south, and answered the ultimate question, if we saved a railway, which one would it be? Spoiler alert, they chose the Seven Valley line, but the other contenders were the Tenbury branch and the Cleobury, Mortimer and Ditton Priors Light Railway. Five days later, the group wandered down to Bridgenorth Station, which had been closed and become overgrown for some time. They symbolically found the station name board lying amongst the grass and decided heartily to put it back in its rightful place. What the hell do you think you're doing? They turned and found a man with a shotgun staring at them from the other platform. This turned out to be George Thorpe, who had continued to run the station refreshment room years after the last train had gone. They explained their good intentions and luckily no one was shot. Guns put to one side, later that month they came back to find more of the track had been ripped up and they quickly telegraphed British Railways to ask them to stop cutting the line, which they thankfully listened to. For the next two years, the group raised funds to buy the line in instalments by having fairground weekends with traction engines and running a miniature railway on the platform. Their efforts clearly worked, because on the 25th of March 1967, the first engine, though privately owned, was Collect Goods No. 3205, arriving under its own steam with two coaches. Several engines, coaches and wagons arrived from then onwards, but they weren't allowed to carry passengers until they got a light railway order. Well, how do we get a light railway order? By means of a prayer. BR was happy to transfer ownership to them, but the Shropshire County Council said no, because they were worried that building back the railway would obstruct a new bypass road that they wanted to make around Bridgenorth. Apparently, these road plans were very hastily put together, so the Ministry of Transport sent an inspector to travel on the train and see for themselves. The fate of the line rested on their decision. Spoiler alert again, they said yes. It was decided that the railway would either have to pay for a bridge to be built over the new road themselves, or cut the line short of Bridge North Station itself so that no bridge was needed north of the track at all. They decided to pay for a bridge, and finally they got permission to run trains on the 20th of May 1970. In the meantime, British Railways had made their infamous ban of steam engines on the main line, which technically included the Severn Valley because they were still leasing the line. They'd been running for about three weeks until someone realised that they were breaking the rules and they had to stop, until someone else realised that they'd saved enough, so they officially bought the line. In 1984, the British Sugar Corporation sweetly moved out of Kidderminster, and BR leased the land to let the railway extend again to terminate next to their own mainline station. Over what used to be the old goods yard, 
A new old-style station was built, Kidderminster Town. It won the award for Best Preserved Station, even though it was just three years old. Finally, everyone was friends. But in 1993, the Seven Valley caught word that BR had plans to auction off the site that the new station was on, since the railway was still leasing it. Panicked, the railway quickly called up and said, oh no you don't, a again, settling to pay the £450,000 asking price to buy it for good. Phew, the Seven Valley weren't going to be taken for no fools. Speaking of which, 1985 saw the 150th anniversary of the Great Western Railway. British Railway celebrated by closing down Swindon Works. What? That's terrible timing! The city of Truro was being restored at Bridge North on behalf of the National Railway Museum. But, as an April Fool's Day joke, they painted it in BR Black, complete with a smoke box number plate and deflectors. These were the days before Photoshop, of course, so it was just a funny little prank. The R7 Valley Railway. That's not funny, it is treachery to the highest degree. City of Truro was preserved in 1931, and so, <coughs> and so never authentically wore BR black. Your paintbrush is treacherous. Throw it in white spirit, and your earliest condition. Thankfully, it seems the Seven Valley retained their attitude, that railways can have a little fun from time to time. Unkind regards, Andy Roberts Mitchell, Chairman of the Green Western Society. Sometimes things are serious, of course. On the 19th of June 2007, a torrential storm struck the Midlands, with at least a month's worth of rain falling in around half an hour. Highly, in particular, was highly affected, with the up signal falling down a collapsed embankment. Only the Kidderminster to Bewdley section was still in running order, and the railway continued running like this for nearly a year, whilst the storm damage was repaired. A side BR, the council and rogue storms, the railway has also suffered from vandals. For instance, in 2011, around £70,000 worth of copper was stolen from the boiler shops at Bridge North, and in 2021, 23 antique enamel signs were pinched from Arley Station. In 2017, two vintage LNER teak coaches were vandalised as well. This is why we can't have nice things. On the plus side, there's still glimmers of hope, as the railway have hosted several charity stunts too. Earlstoke Manor was tasked with carrying the Olympic torch, ahead of the opening ceremony for London 2012, and was later re-identified as surviving classmate Bradley Manor. They thought it would be funny to paint the smoke box gold in order to commemorate Bradley Wiggins and the rest of Team GB's success in London, complete with sideburns apparently. Dear Seven Valley Railway that's not authentic, Bridge North is one of the few places in the UK that are able to construct locomotive boilers from scratch. You can only presume that a railway with such good workshop facilities would have a grand fleet of locos itself, and you'd be right, but a lot of them are privately owned and run on behalf of their owners or owning societies. There's loads of them, so let's take a look at a handful. Port Talbot Saddle Tank number 813 built by Hudswell Clark in 1900. This engine was based at Dufferin Yard Sheds in South Wales, before being sold by the Great Western to the National Coal Board to work at the Backworth Collieries. Fortunately, in 1950, it was given a new boiler by its original maker and a new firebox in 1963, which left it in good shape five years later to be bought once it had been withdrawn. Hawksworth Pannier number 1501. Rare in the fact that it's a pannier with outside cylinders. This was part of a class of 10, ordered by the Great Western, but completed by British Railways in 1949, to shunt empty coaching stock between Paddington and Old Oak Common. Afterwards, it was also sold to the National Coal Board to work in Coventry, along with two classmates. Longmore Military Railway No. 600 Gordon, the big blue engine. Designed by the standard man Robert Riddles for the War Department in Glasgow 1943. Gordon served at Longmore as a driver training engine, but in 1957 also worked trains to Southampton to assist in the Suez Canal crisis. The first one, not the second, obviously. 
though I'm sure Gordon would have helped. Despite being big, blue, and named Gordon, there's no actual connection to the Thomas character, as it was named after Major General Charles Gordon. Number 686, the Lady Armadale. I presume the G is silent, it's not Armagdale, right? I don't know. Weirdly named, but this is a Hunslet chest class, built in 1898 for the Manchester Ship Canal's ironic rail network. Designed with coupling rods that could pivot and varying types of springs on the axles, so that the engine could negotiate the type curves on the quayside. Because of this, the class were nicknamed Jazzers, for bouncing along in a dance fashion and because they probably had an acquired taste for Oasis. The Lady was originally called St. John, but having worn no name when it was sold to the not at all evil sounding Imperial Chemicals Industries, it took the name of the engine it replaced there. In 1992, classmate number 680 Gothenburg came to visit its sibling on the Severn Valley, but it arrived dressed in Thomas costume. That would have been an interesting conversation at the table. The railway thought, hey, that's not such a bad idea. And soon the lady was also kitted out as Thomas, just like the East Lanx Railway had done. As Thomas, the engine visited many other railways, and even went overseas, to Holland and Germany, to attend Days Out with Thomas events there too. Get ready for a list, because other engines include <gasps> a Collet 1400, Battle of Britain, Tor Valley, a Stanya Mogul, a Black 5, an ATF, a Jinty, a Mickey Mouse Ivert 2MT, the Flying Pig Ivert 4MT, two standard 4MTs, a 2800, a Churchwood 4300, two Panniers, two Large Prairies, one Small, Earlstoke Manor, Hinton Manor, Bradley Manor, Hagley Hall, and Manning Wardle, Warwickshire. On site, there's also a replica of Trevithick's Catch Me Who Can and under construction is a BR standard 3MT tank. If you thought that was a lot of steam engines, I've not even mentioned the diesels yet. One futuristic thing to note is one of the Class 08s is currently being rebuilt to be a hydrogen shunter rather than a diesel powered one. Living at the railway, there are three Ruston Hornsby shunters, five BR 08s, two 09s, a Class 11, a Teddy Bear Class 14, a Bear Class 35, a tractor class 37, Greyhound, a warship class 42, five named class 50s and three named western class 52s. As of writing, temporarily based on the line, is also a class 17, a 33, a 40 and two more class 50s, just for the fun of it. I say temporarily based because, as you'll probably have noticed, the line is host to many engines of many backgrounds so long as they're not l &E -R designs, apparently. But the home fleet is often changing as the needs require. They're also blessed with a mix of rolling stock at the Severn Valley, because apart from the usual Mark 1s, they have a rake of l &E -R teaks. Fittingly, there's also quite a mix of pre-grouping stock, mainly from the western region, and wagons seem to be scattered left, right and centre at almost all of the stations. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the route itself. The journey typically takes around 70 minutes each way, across the 16 miles. Most stations have at least limited parking, but it's best to start your journey either at Kidderminster or Bridge North. Let's start where it all started and work our way down. Bridge North is in Worcestershire and is a historic medieval market town a short walk from the station. Cross over the footbridge and you'll find the tilting remains of the castle, and further along, the Cliff Railway. This is one of the longest in Britain, and a welcome sight to anyone who doesn't want to walk the steep climb between the two levels of the town. At the station itself is a shop and a cafe, and where most of the working engines start their day. The train heads south over that dratted bypass, across Oldbury Viaduct, and into Nolsands Tunnel before reaching the summit of the line and rolling down a long 1 in 100 gradient to Eardington Holt. This is more of a photographer's spot these days, because trains don't really stop here anymore. Where most trains pass each other. There's a garden railway at the end of the platform 
and coaches selling second-hand railway items. Crossing into Shropshire, you'll pass Country Park Halt, which is a request stop before stopping at Highley. A colliery used to branch off from here, and where the sidings once stood, now stands the engine house. This is the main visitor centre for the line. Many of the out-of-use engines are accessible here. There's an exhibition about the history of the line, and a balcony where you get a brilliant view of trains steaming to and from the station. Onwards over Boral Viaducts to Arley, which was dressed up as Hatley Station for the 90s comedy O oh Dr Beeching. This is a quiet countryside station near to the Arley Ob... 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 Arboretum. Near to the Arley Arboretum, which, after googling, I found means a botanical garden, mainly based around trees and woodland. That's not really important in this case, because there's a botanical garden there anyway. Leaving the station here, you can take a 20 minute walk along the riverbank to Victoria Bridge, a Grade 2 listed structure, and one that's quite often used for filming on the line. The train passes Northwood Holt, again a request stop. Budley is next, which is a junction station with three platforms and a bunch of sidings which are occasionally used to store stock from the main line. Looking out the window is a view that may be surprising if you haven't been before, because it's quite likely that you'll see southern white rhinos and Bactrian camels staring back at the train. This is the West Midland Safari Park, which of course is worth a visit in itself, as you can drive through the various exhibits, including one of the few places in the UK to have African elephants. There have been rumours of a new station being built here. The track finally curves eastwards and leaves the river to pass the line down to Mount Pleasant Tunnel, before itself heading into Budley Tunnel. One of the last milestones on the line is Falling Sands Viaduct, which thankfully is still standing despite its unfortunate name. In 2020 a major restoration was completed, with a donation wall being unveiled in the engine house. The train passes the diesel depot and the carriage sheds, crosses the junction to the main line and pulls into the final stop, Kidderminster Town. There's a cafe and a gift shop here, the Coal Yard Miniature Railway running parallel to the platforms, and Kidderminster Railway Museum beyond that, which features a range of artefacts from all over the region and a few wagons outside too. There's a turntable here for residents and incoming tour engines to spin around, but there are plans to have a second turntable built at Bridge North, because why have one when you can have two? Kidderminster itself is a big town and has plenty to offer as you weave around the streets, including a museum of carpet, if textiles is your thing. That is the Severn Valley Railway. Trains run throughout most of the year, and steam and lights trains take place in November and December. Other special events include the famous Spring and Autumn Steam Galas, which very often have visiting engines from the main line or from other steam railways. Considering all it's been through, the line has held firm to its position of being one of the UK's premier preserved railways, and is definitely one to keep coming back to as engines come and go. It's rare that a railway can cater for steam, diesel and hydrogen loco enthusiasts, let alone those who just want to find a pretty place to watch trains go by. If you'd like to visit the line yourself, the best way to start is to get the train or car to Kidderminster, southwest of Birmingham, or to drive to Bridge North, south of Telford. There's a link to their website below for more info. Tune in next month to see where we visit next, or become a patron of mine to watch the next episode of Guide Rail early. Unkind regards, goodbye.
thank you to all of my wonderful patrons Alex Goodman, GBH Train, Donald Nine and Douglas Ten, D0280 Falcon, Sean Tempest, Nat, Sam Bennett, Alco, Henry Forrester, GK, and Bluebell Productions.